welcome and thank you all for joining us. I am Neil Richardson from FOUR, Focus on Racial Equality. I am joined by Tabitha Moore, President of the Rutland Branch of the NAACP, and Caitlin Gilvin, also of the Rutland Branch NAACP, and who is the host of the Zoom program that we are running tonight. Please note that this event is being recorded by Orca Media in Montpelier, as well as by the NAACP branch. This forum was originally planned a few months ago around the issue of the Vermont requirement that police officers record the race of people to whom traffic citations are issued. The virus pandemic put it on hold. Then the national outcry of protest against systemic racism made us realize that a public meeting such as this is very important. The purpose of this forum is for law enforcement officials to provide information about what they are proactively doing to address systemic racism and white supremacy culture and to invite the community to ask questions and engage law enforcement in conversation. I want to personally thank Scott Cloat, Captain of the Orange County Sheriff's Department and Bill Bonyak, Orange County Sheriff for their willingness and effort in bringing this forum to fruition. Scott will take the presenting lead and introduce you to his team in just a few minutes. We recognize that the topic of racism is painful and difficult. All kinds of feelings come up for people and we're not asking attendees to limit their feelings. What we do ask is that you refrain from personally attacking others. Name calling and threats of violence will not be tolerated. Caitlin has a few words about how the forum will be presented this evening and how your participation will be handled. Caitlin. Hi, thanks. Um, so we've got 43 people here. I'm going to press a button now to mute everybody but me. Um, and when you want to be unmuted when we get to the point for general discussion, um, you can either raise your hand if you're in the video, if you have your video on, um, or there's um, an option to sort of virtually raise your hand, you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, a reminder that we are recording. If you'd like to turn your video off, if you don't wanna be seen for whatever reason, you have the option to stop your video. Um, and you're welcome to do that. There is a chat at the bottom um, of the screen. There's a chat option. We'll keep an eye on the chat. So if you have questions as we go along, you can put them in there. We are gonna limit people's questions when we get to that portion to about two minutes. So as to give as everybody as much, or give the opportunity to talk to as many people as possible. Um, and we will also look at, at questions that have come through the chat at, at that point. Um, and yeah, I think that's I think that's it. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, you can um, write a note to me in the chat, and I'll I'll see if I can help you that way. Um, and thanks again for being here. Okay, here we go on mute, and then I will unmute the sheriff's office. I can find them. There you go. You all set. Neil, were you all done before I jump in? I had more I wanted to say. Please. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Neil. OK. All right. I'm on. Um, I just want to finish up what my, my introduction. Be aware that many of the questions were submitted in advance and some were quite similar. 
Uh, in order to accommodate all who responded, we have consolidated those that were similar and given them to the sheriff's panel to address up front. Following the office's presentations, I will present further questions that were submitted in advance. After that, discussion and questions from the floor will be open. Remember too, that this is a community forum for Orange County. We aren't making any policy decisions here. We are just listening to what people have to say. We encourage you to continue this discussion with the sheriff's office, your town officials, and state representatives if you feel so moved. And now I have the very good pleasure of introducing to you Scott Cloat, captain of the sheriff's department of Orange County, which will, who will lead the presentation. Good evening, all. Thank you very much for uh, allowing us to attend this meeting. Um, before I turn it over to my two other deputies that I have here with me, I just want to read a very brief statement from um, myself and Sheriff Bonnack and the Sheriff's Office. The murders of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis and Ahmaud Aubrey by armed vigilantes in Georgia and the slaying of young EMT Brianna Tyler in Louisville, Louisville during a no-knock police raid have shocked the conscience of Vermont, the nation, and the world. And these instances do not stand in isolation, but exist as part of our nation's tragic, centuries-long history of racist violence and abuse of African Americans. Many of our fellow citizens in all parts of the nation have spoken up in recent weeks to peacefully protest and condemn police brutality, vigilantism, social and economic injustice, and racism, racism in all its forms. As law enforcement leaders to model of our use and of all, all of our citizens, the values of community engagement, trust, and constructive dialogue around these issues of our times, especially racism, social, and economic inequality. The sheriff and all deputies are committed to fostering respect, constructive, peaceful, and in the public engagement around the issues of racism, social, and economic injustice as they exist in our community. We recognize the demand for accountability, transparency, and training along with the education of the citizens and our community on who we are. Remaining flexible on the new innovating training that will help keep us with our ever-changing world. That being said, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Deputy Victor Hanosa, who will give a very brief uh, description on who he is and what he and why he is a Orange County Sheriff's Office Deputy. Hello, I'm Deputy Hanosa. I work for the Orange County Sheriff's Department. I'm a native Vermonter. I'm from Bristol, Vermont. Uh, that's where I grew up, went to school. Um, I originally became a police officer in Berlin, Vermont, when I moved to uh, Barry City. Uh, and I just started with the Sheriff's Department full time uh, just about two, maybe three months ago. Um, I'm an Eagle Scout from Troop 543. I am an active member of the Army Reserves 424 Engineering Company in Rutland. I study political science at Norwich University, and I'll be finishing that up uh, this coming May. Um, a couple of years ago, probably two, three years ago, I interned for uh, the Honorable Governor Phil Scott uh, and his constituent. Uh, response office, had a blast there. Um, why did I join law enforcement? I've always had a mindset of, um, you know, that I should try to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. So um, uh, that's why I started. Uh, and I wanted to kind of, uh, if, I, if I saw that I could make a difference, and I did, um, I thought that I could help kind of make a positive change uh, in my community uh, or the communities that I serve. Uh, so that's why I started. Let me introduce uh, Deputy Kerry Pine, who is also our K-9 officer for the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Good evening. Um, I'm Deputy Kerry Pine. So I'm also a native Vermonter. I grew up in Brookfield. So I went to Randolph High School. So I've been involved in the Randolph community. Um, basically my entire life, I uh, joined the army and ran away and vowed never to return to Vermont. And yet here I am. Um, I started my law enforcement career with uh, Northfield Police Department and have been here with Orange County for a little over two years. And as Scott said, I am the canine officer. I just actually finished recertifying with my dog in Ohio here in April. 
and we are hoping to be back on the road here shortly. We had a little bit of a hiccup um, incident when we were out there. Um, so we've kind of been taking some time off. Um, why I got into law enforcement, um, the civil service portion, obviously I uh, very involved with the military and then Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, I grew, had seven older brothers. Um, so I've been involved in scouting my entire life and very community oriented, very family oriented. Um, but also I like the job because every day is different. You meet different people every day. You have different situations every day and I get to wear a lot of different hats and I enjoy it because I'm not stuck in an office. I get to be out and meeting new people and interacting with people. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, I wanted to let you know, everybody know that both uh, Deputy Honoso and Deputy Pine are dedicated Orange County deputies here in the Randolph Village uh, community. Um, so they also know uh, a lot about the village and help strive to keep the community safe. Uh, my name is uh, Scott Cluot. I am the captain with the Orange County Sheriff's Office. I've been in law enforcement for the last 13 years. I started my career uh, back in St. Johnsbury and I uh, started as a part-time certified officer. Um, I always had a idea that I wanted bigger and better. Uh, and I went to Hartford, White River, Vermont, um, where it was a much bigger uh, police department and a very bigger patrol area. I soon came to realize that uh, the bigger area was not really for me. I really enjoyed knowing the community members and the people that uh, I, I serve. And I ended up here in Randolph uh, as a patrol officer. I was here for about three years. Uh, and then a spot opened up in the sheriff's office as a special investigations unit detective, uh, which I got accepted into. And I spent uh, about six years in the special investigations unit. Um, that was a very, uh, it really furthered my career in regards to investigations, which is the course of track that I really enjoy is the investigation piece. The, uh, the other piece is, uh, you know, uh, over the last two years, uh, I came out of the Special Investigations Unit and uh, took the Lieutenant position here at the Orange County, uh, the Randolph substation when the Randolph PD was uh, disbanded. And uh, I've been here ever since. Uh, as of last year, I got promoted to captain and I have not just only Randolph anymore, but I have the entire Orange County under my watchful eye. Why I became a police officer. Through uh, my years growing up, uh, you know, even with neighborhood kids, when we always played cops and robbers, I was always the cop. Uh, I always felt the need to help people. Before I was a law enforcement officer, I was also a EMT and firefighter. I really enjoyed um, helping that my community out. Any other further questions and we can open up to the question forum. Just quickly, if you wouldn't mind slowing down. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> that would be fantastic because our closed captioning is us trying to type and keep up with you. Oh, I recommend. Oh. Thank you for. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. And so, if folks have questions, um, or Neil, Neil, you had questions you wanted to start with, right? So I will unmute you. Okay, I'm on. There you go, have Neil. Do you have the questions? Do I have the questions? Do you have those questions that we were going to make to Scott? Yeah, I can pull them up. You give me just a second. I don't. I have all the others. I don't have okay. those. Don't I can't. Me. Oh God Almighty! Let's see. And it's all part of the process of trying to run a community forum. All right. So here are the questions that you sent. Um, the first is, what do you think about the 10-point plan presented by Commissioner Schierling? Uh, I think it's very solid. Uh, and, you know, currently the Orange County Sheriff's Office is uh, doing most of what's uh, being proposed in the 10-point plan. Um, 
which you know we still have to remain very fluid um, in regards to whatever comes down the pipe with Scott, I'm gonna ask you, I think that's Scott. I need you to speak up and I think somebody else needs you to speak more clearly. Okay. So use your cheerleader voice. <laughs> My cheerleader voice? <laughs> yes. Is this any better, ma'am? Yes, thank you. Uh, in regards to the 10 point program, um, we are fully uh, ready to go with it. Uh, most of the sheriff's office is uh, currently adhering to mo uh, all aspects of this 10 point program. Um, there's a few tweaks that we've got to you know, uh, revisit, but we're already on board with this program. I will be 76. Could you uh, go over for folks what is in the 10 point plan and how the sheriff's department is already meeting that or what you're going to be doing to meet them? Sure, so part of the 10 point program, uh, number one is the hiring practice. Uh, so you know what the sheriff's office also needs to kind of adhere or start uh, doing is start bringing on uh, more disinterested people in regards to the hiring process, uh, people outside of the department which we're currently looking into updating. Uh, another piece is training. Um, again, we're trying to remain fluid with the training and what's gonna come down for the, uh, am I speaking too fast, ma'am? Okay. Uh, so remaining fluid in regards to what's coming down the pike you know, for a state mandate. Uh, but we do training in-house and we also do uh, multiple trainings at the police academy, which, re which is required by the state. Uh, promotion and supervisor selection. Um, again, we're still currently doing that. Um, we just need to tweak a little bit in regards to having outside people weighing in their responses. Uh, improper conduct and allegations. Again, we still do that all in house. Um, you know, and it's also just bringing in the other parties to weigh in, in on their decisions as well. Data. Uh, again, when the first start of the race collection data was implemented in Vermont, we were on board with it and started collecting it. Um, and hoping that a statewide system is generated and we're all on board with that and ready to go. Uh, again, still remaining fluid in regards to what the state will mandate uh, coming, down, coming down the area here. Body work cameras, uh, we have a small handful already in the field here at the Sheriff's Office. All the deputies here in the Randolph Village area do carry uh, body worn cameras and we have policies procedures in regards to those body cameras. Community co uh, collaboration. Uh, again, you know, we're already doing that within the community. Um, and again, it's small little tweaks in regards to, uh, you know, having more people have more of a voice um, that we can listen to and take a part of. Community oversight models. Again, um, you know, we just need to tweak up a little bit, having more people uh, outside of the sheriff's office to attend our oversight. Um, and we are very willing to have that done, more than well. I'm sorry, could you back up and explain, I, people aren't, most of the people have not seen this. So when you talk about community oversight models, could you explain what the mandate is and what you currently have and what is going to be changing? I think that would be helpful for folks as I'm looking at questions. Okay, so the, the the outline for the community oversight models is all law enforcement agencies must one or more means of providing community oversight. Such oversight would include assessment of and input regarding hiring, training, promotional process, policy development, and accountability and discipline. So again, I mean, we're, we handle a lot of stuff all in-house, but bringing people in um, is a step that we're also looking into and bringing on board. Uh, policy, this one's the major one that we really have to be fluid on regarding a statewide model policy on the use of force of all law enforcement agencies and officers. We currently have a use of force policy. Um, and, you know, it, and again, we are also trying to be very fluid with what the state will mandate in regards to uh, the use of force policies. Uh, but we do have our own internal one. Could you explain to people what the difference is between the two? 
What do you mean, ma'am? Between the uh, statewide use of force policy that they have talked about so far, the one that just passed S219. Uh, again, I haven't, I haven't seen it, so I, I, I don't know. I, I'm only, I have my policy in front of me, but I don't have what has recently passed. Okay. Uh, uh, and the last point was the military equipment in regards to military surplus uh, military equipment. Um, we here do have uh, military equipment, uh, such as Humvees, uh, backpacks, uh, rifles, optics, night vision, stuff of that nature. Um, the reason why that we were doing that was public safety and also budgetary and financial restraints upon our department. Um, and again, we're going to remain fluid in regards to what the state uh, brings down in regards to a policy for the, this surplus equipment. Do you have that electronically so that we could put it in the chat for folks to read? The 10 point policy? Yeah, my last draft is old. Uh, this one is two, ma'am. Okay. It was back in June. This was the, the draft policy. Right. Uh, and what they have talked about and uh, in, at the State House, I don't have an updated policy. We have a question about what the current, I think it's referring to what your current use of force policy is. Uh, on what, what point? I mean, we've revamped our, you know, we've reviewed and revamped our use of force policy. Uh, recently, our sheriff has worked with a community member to update our use of force policy. Also update our fair and impartial policing policy. A couple of key components in our use of force policy is de-escalation, no chokeholds, Duty to intercede, obligation to step in or face individual liability. Communication tactics that can be used to intercede quickly, professionally, and effectively. Least amount of force required to use any force be documented. That's what our current policy is. Is there any way you could put that in the chat so folks could read that and I don't have to try to write all that? I, I do not have a digital copy ready to go. I got to dig through my emails and things like that to post it on. Okay. Do you have it, if you have it available on your website? And I'm sorry, I'm not typing in closed caption. Then we can just put your website in the chat for people to be able to access. Both our uh, fair and impartial uh, policy and our use of force are is on our website. Uh, Orange County Sheriff. I'll find that and add it to the chat. I think those were the questions that we had. Um, oh, so let's see. The um, final one that we had prepared uh, was how will you ensure that the fair and impartial policing committee is diverse and has the ability to impact community policing? So like I said, we're still working on this piece right now. Um, so I don't have those appropriate answers for you right now. Uh, we're still working on that to have that diverse uh, crowd am amongst us. Neil, did you have um, more you wanted to say? Or you, I think, had well, a... Yeah, oh yeah. Um, I, I guess, and it's my fault, the, diff the questions that we were gonna ask Scott with regard to the 10 points, I think between what Tabitha just did and what you did, I think we've already asked them. One of the things that I wanted to do right now is to read um, 
and this is related to the 10 points. It was a, uh, a note that I received from Paul Kendall. A lot of you people in town know Paul. And he wanted to, he couldn't be at the meeting, but he wanted me to read this. And my concern has long been that while most offices are respectful, there are individuals who let a minor infraction escalate into a major confrontation, sometimes with bad outcomes. When this happens, too often the version of the events given by the officers is accepted by superiors, prosecutors, and the public as being the truth when we now know that is frequently not the case. Timely body camera video and voice recordings are what can correct this problem and restore trust between the police and the public. Training does not do the job and policies are only as good as their implementation. Inspect what you expect was the business philosophy I grew up with. And in this case, body cam videos are the only way to inspect. There, there are also the issues of making such videos as well as the finding of any complaint proceeding available to the public. But let's start by ensuring that the primary evidence is captured and preserved. Um, you care to comment on that, Scott? Wait, before Scott, can you, Neil, can you just email that to me quickly so I can put it in the chat so people can read it? Oh, <laughs> he can't because he's on the computer. <laughs> What'd you say? He wanted you to email it to her right off. Can we do it after the fact, Tabitha? E email. <laughs> email Paul Kendall's thing to her. I can, I'll have to do it after. Yeah, we can maybe plan to put together an email. I can help you, Neil. We have all these people emailed you. We have their, their, um, a list so we can put together some sort of resources at the end that to reflect the different things we're talking about. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. Okay. Jesus Christ. I guess, Neil, uh, what, what kind of question are you, are, are you asking in regards that uh, Orange County utilize, utilizes body cameras? Is that what your question is? Do, do you now use body cameras, Scott? Yes, we do. Uh, we have a small handful of body cameras that are issued to all the respected deputies that work here in the Randolph Village. And the reason okay. for that is due to this is our most high call, uh, call, uh, high call volume contract that we have at the Sheriff's Office. Okay. Neil, you have more? No. Um, I don't know when, what was the girl's name? What's the woman talk? Oh, Carrie. Carrie. Yeah. I don't know when Carrie talked, if she mentioned, um, did she mention the thing that, can Irene Schaefer? That's right. Um, Scott, I'd like to, I'd like to read another um, question that was sent sent to me, and I don't think that Carrie addressed it when she talked. Um, back in the this is from Irene Schaefer. Back in the 1990s, we had a police officer named Tom Simpson who did a lot of foot patrol on the streets of downtown Randolph. He related to the shop owners and also to the young people in town. His manner was easy going, and so he made many friends with locals, old and young. Sometime a few months ago, there was an article in the Herald about a young woman sheriff who was to be doing similar work, walking out downtown with the dog. I think her name was Pine, and that's the young lady that was here. Um, to my knowledge, that has never happened. I'd like to know why, as it seems, the sheriff making friendly contact out on the beat is more productive than sheriffs sitting in their cars waiting for traffic violations. I wouldn't say that it's more productive. Um, it's more, it's, it's just a different community policing aspect. Um, 
A, it gives myself and the dog a break from the office or from riding around in the car. I grew up in this community, so I know a lot of the people in the community already, or a lot of people in the community know my parents or my brothers. Uh, so I like to just get out and visit with people, and I like to get out and get the dog out. And um, Diesel is a great, I don't want to say bridge, but um, I get a lot of questions, especially from young kids about the dog and, well, from people of all ages about the dog. Uh, so it just kind of open, opens up that communication because I think that law enforcement, uh, the community should view us as approachable and just like part of the community. And that's kind of why we do the foot patrols because it does, again, it gives us a break from the office or from the car, but uh, it also gets us out and gets the community familiar with who I am and who Diesel is and kind of shows I get to meet people in the community, so. You know, and just one step further that, uh, you know, we are conducting foot patrols in the uh, downtown Randolph area. Um, and we, we do um, document those foot patrols. And when we're doing foot patrols, we're not just walking up and down the sidewalk and then calling it a day. We're, you know, interacting with people who may be on the sidewalk or going into stores just to see how things are going. If they need anything, um, any call, any uh, questions, comments, concerns that we may be able to answer. Um, we, we are currently doing that at this point in time. Uh, Caitlin, uh, Sheriff Bill Boniak is uh, in attendance and he's requesting to be unmuted. Is that a possibility? Yeah, let me see if I can find him. Oh, I see. Sorry, there's um, a lot of people. There you go. Good evening, everyone, and thank you. Um, I tried to wave my hand there uh, earlier, but uh, uh, several people asked where I am. I am on the sidelines for tonight. Um, Neil has been working with Scott uh, for the last several months. I met Neil maybe two years ago now, and uh, Neil wanted to meet some of the other deputies, and Scott was the contact person, and for tonight, uh, I let Scott take the lead on this, but I, I just want to bring to everyone's attention, uh, not only am I the sheriff of Orange County, but I'm also still a president of the Vermont Sheriff's Association. And that 10 point list that uh, Commissioner Sherling put out publicly, um, the Vermont sheriffs are part of that. Um, we, um, we helped instrument uh, a lot of those uh, pieces of that along with uh, Vermont chiefs of police. So it's, it's multi agencies coming together. And uh, the other thing I just want to bring up our use of force policy, we did modify it. Um, and it may be modified again, same with the fair and impartial policing and other aspects of law enforcement, because um, when August rolls around the end of August, the legislatures will be back in session and they're gonna take up more issues uh, of law enforcement. So this is a ever-changing times right now. So, uh, but we're trying to be fluid and be tra uh, absolutely transparent. And, uh, you know, that's why we're here tonight. We wanna reassure the community we are, we are here, we're listening. So, and I thank you very much. And uh, thanks Scott and Carrie and Victor for stepping up uh, and, you know, telling everyone who they are and what we're doing here. So we're part of the community. Um, I had a, a saying I said a long time ago, I'd rather be a part of the community than apart from it. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it back up to Neil, Caitlin and Scott. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, is Larry Sackowitz on in the group tonight? No, I guess not. Oh, he is. I just unmuted him. Yeah, I'm here. I got, she just unmuted him. Oh, okay. Let me turn my video on. You all see me. Hi. So yeah, I had some a couple of questions that you're referring to, Neil. Yeah. Yeah. You have the questions, Larry. 
I had a couple of questions, yeah. So um, one, of, one of my questions was, I've been reading about, you know, some of, sort of the, where some of the, um, you know, the impetus to the, some of the violence that we've been hearing about in the news for so long. And it seems like a lot of it starts with um, um, regular police training and kind of moves into the local police cultures in one form or another. And it seems like it's really part of police culture nationwide. Um, and I'm wondering what you all do at, in Orange County to resist the sort of pressures that stem from those kinds of trainings that I've been hearing about. Uh, I apologize, sir. What kind of trainings? Uh, oh, we have? I've, been, I've been reading that uh, it's very common for for police in the course of their trainings to to be, you know, to view the public as sort of, you know, the other and the and and, and a threat, and that you know police officers can be killed, you know, by anyone at any time, and they have to be extremely vigilant, which is of course true. But it seems like from some of the readings that I've done that. Um, these things are stressed so much that police officers leave their trainings in police academies um, probably more frightful of the public than they really need to be considering the actual nature of the threat and that that sort of infiltrates departments and, and makes officers perhaps more scared than they need to be. And so I'm, I'm wondering how that affects you all here in Orange County and what you might be doing to sort of push back on some of the fear which seems to be um, driving um, at least some of the police brutality that we've been hearing about? Uh, for me, sir, uh, you know, I went to the full-time academy back in 07. Um, was there a lot of, you know, hey, you got to really pay attention to what your surroundings are? Um, you know, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the driving force was go home at night. Um, but when you actually get out into the actual community, you are still very hyper vigilant. Um, you are aware of your surroundings, um, but it, it takes that kind of person that it's not police brutality that they're training at the academy. It's, you know, maybe it's the hyper vigilance as you have commented, but, um, you know, you, you get out and you have a conversation, you talk to people, um, and, you know, that kind of piece right there really pushes back on people's perception or your own as a law enforcement officer's perception on the general public. Um, and with that, it makes it a lot easier to uh, not have use of force complaints, not have the uh, complaints all around around that you are, you know, in any shape or form over aggressive. Um, another question that I had was um, a couple of years ago, I was, I was on the town committee that um, oversaw and recommended the, the transition from a local force in Randolph to using the Orange County for our policing. And when we, when we made that switch, one of the things we did is we um, not only changed the, you know, the, the entity doing the policing, but we, <clears throat> we also um, contracted for far fewer hours through Orange County than the old Randolph department was um, was doing as a something about half. I mean, we we cut the number of patrol hours in about half um, from the Randolph Police Force to what we have now, and um, no one seemed to have noticed. Um, everything seems perfectly calm, and um, every you know the town seems to be doing just great. And um, it sort of makes you wonder, you know, how much policing do we really need? Um, if we could drop the police hours by half and nothing really changes. Um, can we drop it further? Like, where do we draw the line? What's, I wonder really what the, what you all, what your take is on what's the proper level of um, policing that we need here in this particular community? And, um, and where, where do you see it going in the future? So uh, in regards to, because there was a patrol officer here in Randolph before I went to the Orange County Sheriff's Office, um, you know, I enjoyed having another person on with me. Uh, I was the low man on the totem pole, so to speak, when I first got here. So I had the dreaded midnight shifts. Um, we're currently, you know, um, my, my deputies go home at uh, one in the morning. 
Um, is there calls for service between one and eight when another deputy signs on? Yes, there is. If it's emergent, uh, those calls do go to the state police, but what we are also seeing is that uh, they immediately get referred right back to us and we've got to pick them up after the fact when the deputy signs on. Um, with, with also, I mean, the deputies here don't sit in the office. We're out in on the street. That's what the contract is for. We're out here providing a community service. Being out on the streets um, more so than ever before, um, it really, when you say something to the effect that, you know, nobody has really noticed, um, all the comments that both I have gotten and with the uh, Sheriff Bonnick has gotten also is that they've seen the Sheriff's cruisers more than they had the Randolph. To me, we're doing the right thing. To me, we're on the street, we're not sitting in the office, we're, you know, we're providing a service. And I think also because we're out all the time is also a, a partial drop in regards to bad things going on. Um, I, I ran numbers before uh, this meeting uh, and a year snapshot from July 7th to uh, 2019 to July 7th, 2020, we had 1900 calls for the service here in the Randolph Village alone. Um, our top 10, you know, traffic stops, directed patrols, citizens assists, agency assists, uh, suspicious events, property watches, foot patrols, motor vehicle complaints, VIN verifications, and welfare checks. Those are our top 10 calls for service here in the village. Um, out of the 1900 calls, um, that's a fair lot. Do we see our major calls too? Yes. Um, when we first took over this contract, we had a shooting. Um, you know, we have violent uh, uh, domestic violence calls. Um, it's all happening here in the community. Uh, back when uh, COVID was really uh, rampant, uh, we did contract for a second deputy to work a split shift from 11 in the morning to nine at night. Um, and that really eased up um, all the way around. So if another officer had paperwork, the other officer was out on the street. If there was a call for service, there was backup. Um, you know, it just, it worked hand in hand very, very well. Um, do I see Randolph kind of trying to cut down hours? Um, I hope not, uh, only because it's it's a needed service here in the community. Hey, uh, you, I'm um, sorry, can you please post those, uh, all of that statistical information in the chat? I cannot capture that in closed captioning that quickly. Please. Sure, it's in paper form in front of me. Uh, I mean, I don't know what, I mean, there's, I, I see all the questions on the chat form. Um, I don't know if there's a way that we can capture these and I can answer them accordingly even after this forum um, and then post this stuff as well. Is that a possibility? I'm unsure. Yeah, I mean, I think we should try and get through questions as much as we can. I, I think some of them for stuff that has data, um, we can put together that email afterwards that'll have maybe follow up information or links to places um, because probably people won't be able to read it all in the chat either. So I think planning to planning to do that is a good idea. No, I was just thinking for the people that are trying to rely on my poor closed captioning, mm -hmm. that if they wanted to engage in the conversation right now and wanted to know what those statistics are, they need a way to do that. Right. So even if you have your phone and could take a picture of your phone and, and upload the file into the chat, that would be great. Okay. Take a picture of the page in front of you. It's like a fax only. Fancy. Working on it. Working on it. It's Sheriff Boniak there. There was also, uh, when Scott mentioned the stats, uh, there was 49 people were arrested last year uh, in the village. And um, the other thing that um, I think helped Larry's uh, question is that since we have 15 sheriff's vehicles uh, total, and all but one is unmarked. So you're seeing what they call an omnipresence in the Randolph community because you have a few of us that live in the community or just on the outsides of the village. So we're, we're in town quite a bit. And uh, so Randolph is fortunate um, to have that extra presence within the community.
So we have a, a number of questions in the chat and also a few people who have um, mentioned in there that they'd like to ask. Um, so I'm gonna go back through the chat a little bit and pull some of those out. Some of them are, are similar to others. Um, so there's a question about training and um, whether the training whether you're planning, whether, is the training changing in light of the current climate with law enforcement and the public? And we covered that a little bit. I mean, we know there's stuff coming down. Um, someone had, had suggested that it might be good to have um, this kind of a forum in a couple months when those policies are solidified. So maybe training questions or policy questions. I don't know, Tabitha, if you agree um, or Neil, that it might make sense to to plan a follow-up um, since, since it sounds like a lot of those are in flux? Um, I, you know, I'm a fan. I, I feel like quite a few people have felt like their questions didn't really get answered. Um, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that S219 just came out and it's coming back, um, you know, and, and figure out what that means is still in flux, but um, being able to answer questions about your own use of force policy and your own fair and impartial policing policy and how it compares to what you have seen so far, that will be critical for your community to know. What is different and what are you doing? Uh, not just, you know, we're working on it, but what are the actual steps and what are the dates and timelines? And again, um, you know, how are you actively pursuing diverse community input? That's what you're gonna to need to be able to answer. It sounds like based on what I'm hearing um, mm -hmm. when you come back together, but absolutely you need to get back together with people because I'm hearing that folks really want that. I'm sorry that's not in the closed captioning and I realize that I'm speaking as quickly as Scott. So I apologize. So Caitlin um, or Tabitha, S219, that's with the improper restraints um, and that did pass and it's holding law enforcement to a, a very tight um, I'd say window about not using any type of choke holds neck holds um, because if a law enforcement officer now um, causes any severe injury to someone's neck area say to get into a scuffle or or death of that person, that law enforcement officer is now subject to 20 years imprisonment and a $50,000 fine. So that just passed. It's, I'm not sure if the governor signed that into law yet. It, I think it went before him yesterday. I actually testified on the bill. It includes use of force, body cameras, which what's going back in, um, for the body cameras is looking at the ACLU recommended, recommended um, policies that um, all departments should implement. Um, it includes, like you said, the banning of chokeholds, and it looks at several other uh, things that have come up tonight. Yes, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, they put an August 1st deadline on the Vermont State Police for, um, for the body cameras and for the rest of us, the locals, uh, municipals and sheriffs, um, and all of the law enforcement. That's going to give us, I think they're going to give us about a year to, to try to find the monies or federal grants to make sure we're all outfitted with those, with the body cameras. Thank you. Oh, one of the questions from the chat, which I'm curious about also is as these new policies are being developed, are you planning to have like more sessions like this or other ways that community can give input and in what those, um, how those policies are developed? Absolutely. Um, you know, we got the direct connection right here with Neil and uh, the bond between actually, you know, I think Scott and Neil has grown tremendously. And uh, we want to work with you know, our community and our partners and uh, making sure we're doing, you know, the right thing here. And uh, it's an ever changing world. And it's, um, you know, um, you know, I didn't have an opportunity to, you know, tell a little bit about myself and maybe at another different time I will. But um, I can tell you this, I'm, I am a flatlander. I'm up in Vermont 20, 28 years now. And I, I came from a very diverse neighborhood in my, in my earlier years.
Hey, when I see somebody with an actual hand up, uh, Lucy Rowe. Oh, yep. Thanks. Um, my question, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. My question is more broad. Um, so it seems to me like there needs to be a really deep cultural shift in the way that policing happens in the country and Vermont. And this is based on a couple of things. One is some statistics that are concerning. So, um, black people are seven times more likely to enter correctional facilities in Vermont than white people. Um, black people and Latinx folks are up to three three or four times more likely to be pulled over by police, um, just to name a couple. That paired with the history of policing in America, which goes back to basically it was in large part um, not too long ago, a system put in place to oppress and criminalize and silence people of color. Um, so that history is there. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because, um, Scott, you're explanation of what you're doing regarding the 10 point program was concerning to me because you kept mentioning that small tweaks here and there need to happen. But I think a lot of us would agree that there needs to be like an entire culture shift. And I'm not hearing that recognition from your office. And um, I'm wondering if that's in the conversation um, with you and your coworkers and how you're addressing that on an individual and institutional basis, um, because I think that's gonna be the root of making all these policy decisions in a really responsible way. Thank you. Of course, um, you know, the culture shift, you know, it, I, absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, the, it, it is a way different than when I first got into law enforcement, that's for, that's for sure. Um, the, the culture shift all the way around is uh, what is needed. You know, I, I make, you know, just of, you know, like tweaks within the uh, policies that we're doing, but, you know, they're, they're all about the, uh, how, how we can better ourselves all the way around and be held to a, a higher standard. Um, there are a couple of, sorry, Lucy, do you want to um, follow up on that? Or are you happy with that response? Or are you still muted again? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, that, I appreciate that sentiment. It feels vague to me. I think, um, I think what a lot of us need to hear is um, I don't want to, I don't want to accuse you of, of being defensive because I think this is a really tricky subject to talk about. And I think that's like a really normal response because I know that you all have done really good work as well. But I think what I'm looking for here is, um, like, I want to see like a real recognition of these systemic issues and like, whether or not you, like the three of you and Bill want it to be this way like the institution of policing is really sick and that's why all of these problems are happening across the world and in our own communities and i just am wondering if that sentiment is part of your everyday conversation and like how are you taking concrete steps to change that culture in the ways that you can just to be a little more specific Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all this is ever changing all the way around and we're catching up with the times as well. Um, as the sheriff has also said in regards to, you know, we have to be very fluid and, and keep rolling with, you know, all these changes, which is also very positive in, in everyone's uh, function here. Um, and again, you know, you talk about everyday conversation and it is an everyday conversation on how you know, we ourselves are doing things. Um, you know, like I said, with the small tweaks of policies and things like that, um, it's still major changes and we're still trying to, you know, adapt with, the uh, uh, adapt with the times and change old policies that were written way back when um, to come up with these times. Um, you know, again, it's very fluid um, and you say I'm very defensive. You're right, it is a very tricky and hard conversation to talk about. Um, you're 100% right. And, um, you know, again, you know, we're trying to do the best we possibly can for all, not just ourselves, but for all, all the way around so everyone is protected. 
Bill's asking to be unmuted here as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, what I was going to say was, uh, if this helps, you know, we, we recently made an arrest of a person of color. And we treated that person just like we treat anyone else. And, you know, uh, the person was, was great to work with. We had no issues whatsoever. Um, the person was cited into court and released. Um, and it doesn't matter, you know, we don't look at the, the person's color or skin. We're looking at, you know, what, what has actually happened? What was, what's the violation? You know, um, just since we were collecting data race on motor vehicle stops, um, we had approximately uh, maybe a year ago or two years ago, we had like 1,500 traffic stops total in Orange County. And out of that 1,500, um, we had, I think, nine people, African-Americans, and 12 people were Asians. Um, and could we, you know, especially... Uh, nighttime or you're running radar somewhere, moving radar, you can't tell a person's um, race, color, um, until you're actually stopping the person in front of them. So, you know, we know this is a very sensitive issue and, you know, I just want to make sure everyone knows we treat everyone the same. There's, you know, with respect and dignity, and uh, I don't know what else to add to that, but I'm just, I'm giving you, you know, what we do. This is what we do. This is how we community police, you know, we're out there in the community talking with people. So um, I hope that answers your, you know, the question that Lucy, you know, it is a, on a nationwide level. Sure. I know there's a lot of problems, but we need to recognize that and make sure we don't you know, bring that stuff here. Thank you. Um, just a quick response. I don't want to be taking up too much time. I, I once again feel like my question has been met with a lot of defensiveness. And I think that like in order for anything to change, every single person on this call, including the sheriffs, need to accept the fact that we've all been raised in a culture that whether it's overt or covert, um, has like seeded in us these biases and it, nothing's gonna change unless all of us um, accept that. And I think like, that's a really hard hard, embarrassing, shameful feeling thing to do. But like, if that's not happening on the level of our, um, you know, policing system, then I, I don't feel very hopeful right now um, based on these answers. And I'm not trying to be overly critical, but I think this is a moment that needs to be met with like a deep reflection. And I just, I, I can't like impress upon, upon that more. Um, and I'm just not, I'm not hearing that. Um, so I, I want to let other people talk. So that'll be my last. Lucy, I, I am not, uh, I'm not trying to be defensive whatsoever. Uh, one of the things I think would really help, um, I think if, if possible, at your convenience, if you could get a hold of either myself or Scott or even any of the deputies and just ride along and talk to them and, you get a better feeling of what we do in, in our community. And I, I'm truly, I'm not being defensive. Um, we do community policing here. I think Neil's trying to talk. Yeah, yes, Neil. Okay, all right. There's, there's two people who've had their hand up. One is Hannah and one is Peter Reed. Yeah. And I think they ought to be let to talk. Yeah. And then after that, I saw one message down here 
if someone is frustrated with the meeting, and I think I understand that. And I guess what I would like to do is to ask you, anyone in the audience here that wants to, after the meeting, send me notes of, of what you would like to have had done and that didn't do, get done. And maybe we can, I would be happy to revisit this again if other people want to do it. But there are two people that need to be allowed to talk. Hannah is one and Peter Reed. Hannah Barden, is that who's waiting? Yeah. All right, you should be able to go, Hannah. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on, on Lucy's questions and I, I don't think I can speak as, um, as eloquently as she has probably, but I did want to sort of compare, make a comparison because I work in education, <clears throat> excuse me, and I have spent a lot of the last few years really understanding how the, the system of education was not um, designed and created to be equitable and it was designed with, um, with biased outcomes in mind. And my, um, the realization that I've come to is that as much as I want to just say, I love all my students, I care about them, I treat them all the same, that if I am not actively on a daily basis working to undo those structures of inequity, then I am, then I am perpetuating the inequities. And I think that what I, I would love to hear and I don't expect a clear answer tonight because it's a it's a big um, it is a big question and it's a, it's it's something that takes a lot of time to to come to and I'm still moving into different places in this myself but I would love I just my understanding is that as policing also has to be doing that same work as if not if on a daily basis um, and this is not as someone mentioned in the chat is not a personal attack on anyone um, the I've had wonderful personal interactions with many of the um, sheriffs and deputies, but um, I just, I think that if, we, you, if we're not constantly reflecting and digging and, um, and re looking how, working against the biases that are baking into the system, that they're not going to just go away. And so um, I think that that's what I'm, I'm hearing Lucy asking for, and I'm, ask, and I'm hoping that um, we can hear that, that your department is is working in that same way and um, and seeing this as a continual not one will fix the policy and it's done um, but it's an ongoing reflection that we all have to be really humble about um, an approach with with an idea to learning um, so I uh, that's that's what I'm hoping to to hear uh, thank you. And you bring up a, a very good point all the way around. And I couldn't agree with you more that, you know, we would have to work with this, you know, every day, um, you know, whether it's, you know, do we encounter people of different races and things like that on a daily basis? Uh, my answer is no, um, we don't. Uh, predominantly, it's a white community all the way around. Uh, predominantly, our calls for service are with white individuals. Um, I implore and hope that, you know, this forum also opens a few more doors in regards to community members uh, wanting to have conversations with us personally. Um, we're here. Uh, we're community members and, um, and I want to release that stigma that it's okay to talk to the police, uh, regardless of your, of your race, religion, creed, all the above. Um, and I could, like I said, I couldn't agree with you more. It needs to be done on a daily basis. Uh, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, and uh, it's a striving uh, point um, with all these policy changes it is still very, very fluid all the way around. Uh, but still, um, if we're not given the opportunity to deal with it on a daily basis, you know, what more can we do? Uh, I don't have an answer for that right now um, because we're still looking into everything that we can possibly do. I don't have those appropriate answers for you. Yeah. I'm going to um, unmute Peter Reed here. Yeah. 
Oh. You guys are still muted. I thought I got you. OK. okay. So, there you are. Okay. Yep. I do want to thank Lucy and Hannah for speaking uh, much of what's on my mind. But I have a, a more pressing question. Um, I appreciate that the three folks have gathered in the sheriff's office there. Um, I don't see them wearing masks. And they're very close to one another in a closed room. And I'm concerned about that. Um, anyone else? There was a, a note about that in the chat as well of people um, observing yeah. deputies interacting with the public without masks as well. So I, I'm curious. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, you're right. And I am currently wearing one right around my neck and uh, I never pulled it up. Uh, so, yeah. I, I don't have a correct answer for you, ma'am. Is there a department policy around mask wearing? Uh, the, there's no written uh, policy in regards to masks, but you know, in your in encounter with the public, you are required to wear a mask. Ever since this COVID thing has transpired. I. Uh... I'm looking for any additional hands up. Just follow the chat. We'll just uh, keep going to the chat room. Dieter, I'm not sure I'm saying that right. You should be unmuted. It's Deirdre. Deirdre, uh, sorry. I, I have a question because I was very concerned when I heard we don't treat people differently based on their color. Um, so many of us uh, white folk are now attending trainings and reading books and and how that we can mitigate our own inherent bias. So I'm wondering if anybody in the sheriff's department is doing the same. Are they reading? Are they attending trainings? And I'm wondering if Scott can address that. Because if we're doing the work, I would think that in deeply personal um, in-depth work that I would think that the police would need to do the same if we're ever going to change that culture. Uh, agreed, ma'am. And, uh, you know, currently we, we are staying abreast with current events and doing that deep reading to get more of a history in regards to, you know, uh, everything that's going on. Um, training is uh, still moving in, you know, uh, a direction that's ever changing. Um, you know, we all attend the fair and uh, impartial unbiased trainings. Um, that is mandated throughout the state. Um, you know, are they few and far between? Yes. Uh, but do I expect to see a change coming out of, out of that right now? Absolutely. Um, what that change is, I don't know yet. Is that? Uh, almost. Um, unbiased training, that's regarding policing. I'm talking about your own personal work and all of your officers' own personal work. Um, because I can attend a, 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 a training, but if they don't recognize their own inherent biases, it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, that's what I'm wondering. Are people doing that kind of work? Not your, not your police training, personal training, uh, things that the NAACP is offering. Mm -hmm. So I, I strongly encourage every, any and every officer to a train, uh, attend such uh, training. Uh, there's no, um, you can never have enough training all the way around um, for not only for the individual officers, uh, but for the department as a whole, you can never have enough training. Um, I'm a very firm believer in that. Um, as you know, these things start to kind of work. I am working on, you know, trying to go through and most suitable trainings, uh, what, what is offered, because uh, I also have to play with cost as well um, and seeing what we can do with many different aspects to hold these interdepartment trainings uh, with uh, whatever is out there that is most beneficial to for not only as a law enforcement level or a personal level as well. Okay. Uh, and just one last question. Where exactly is your use of force policy on the website? I have found I found the fair policing policy, but I cannot find anything that says about use of force. 
Uh, let me double check all that all around and I will get that right out to you guys. That would be great. Um, it, I can't operate two screens at one time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, people are putting suggestions for books they have found helpful in the chat. Awesome. Um, if there's anything that your officers are reading or following that you'd like to share, people are interested. Thank you. Lucy, I see your hand up. I'm going to see if anybody else has has um, questions before we come back to you. What else is in the chat room, Caitlin? Tamara, I'm going to, or Tamara, I'm sorry, um, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, trainings tend to only skim the surface. And I think what Deirdre was getting at is, you know, I'd like to know exactly what you, Scott, or you, Bill, um, are actually personally doing in terms of reading, the deep reading that you're alluding to. Um, what exact books are you reading? What types of things are you looking at? You, you seem to mention current affairs and keeping up with the news, but that's not what we're talking about. I understand them, and you know, uh, I'm going to be brutally honest with you: is that uh, you know, when I get done here as you know a sheriff's deputy, I get home late at night, and I've got uh, three young kids. My reading time does not consist of very much anymore. Um, so, you know, I am behind the eight ball in regards to looking for other resources for me myself. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I see a lot of great suggestions, which um, I am very hopeful and in looking into uh, looking at these suggestions right now uh, for me myself personally. Um, I'm adding into the chat here that NAACP is going to be holding some virtual study groups um, in the summer into the winter for some of the, several of the books being mentioned in the chat, um, which is open to everyone. Beautiful. And those are found uh, probably right on your website too, right, Mom? Um, we're still in the planning stages. They will be available on the website once, once we've got dates and times, um, figured out. Check back with us on July 15th. Yeah, that's our, that's our internal deadline. Mickey, I see you waving. Yeah. I'm just wondering, are there still some other questions in the chat room that we haven't gotten to yet? Yes. There are a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you. Let's, um, let's try to get a few more of those in. Yep. Uh, let's see. Um, lots of questions. Mm -hmm. um, there are questions about working with community groups, or um, you know, we, you have when you were giving the statistics in terms of what the calls were like. What of those calls? could potentially be answered by someone who is not armed, right? Who's not necessarily a police officer and are there community groups that you can work with for mental health calls, say, or, or similar um, things? And are there resources that the community could give you to make that more possible? Sure. We have a very close relationship with uh, the Claire Martin Center here in town. Uh, we also work very hand in hand with Gifford Medical. Um, you know, in regard, you, you brought up mental health calls. Um, regarding such, um, very rarely do, am I able to have, uh, you know, mental health screeners or counselors come out in the field, um, you know, in regards to somebody in crisis. Uh, with the whole COVID thing that has transpired, um, one of our things that we were working on with Claire Martin was Zoom. Um, that they could FaceTime with the person that was experiencing the mental health crisis to uh, go about that way also. Um, but we are working with area communities uh, such as, you know, Claire Martin, Gifford, and um, 
we haven't gotten to the point where are they coming out into the field just yet. Um, we are exploring avenues within Orange County in regards to social workers um, being implemented in the sheriff's office. Uh, but we're, we're just not right there just yet. We're still in the early planning stages. Yes, Neil. Jacob Kaplan has a question. Jacob, I will unmute you. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I, I, I um, appreciated Scott's answer um, regarding the involvement of different community um, resources like the Clara Martin Center. Um, I, I would just be curious um, to keep the uh, public informed about that um, and, and maybe further, this might take a little bit more um, communication between uh, those community centers and uh, Scott, your team. Um, but, you know, something like if, if there is a call um, that comes in uh, requiring um, someone, a, a health professional or, or, or something like that, that those people would immediately be um, notified at the same time as, as you guys, Scott. I mean, I, I would be curious to see uh, what you all do with that in terms of the cooperation between uh, those two entities. Um, and I, I just personally would, would um, like to see that uh, happen. And um, I'm glad to hear that it, the ball is already kind of rolling. So um, uh, maybe just one one more uh, thing to add. And, and Scott, if you could, um, or any of your, uh, Scott or Bill would, would be willing to answer this. Um, I know earlier in, in, in this discussion, um, you brought up uh, the types of calls that you get most frequently. Um, and I just wanted to ask specifically, uh, do you all find it necessary to be armed during those interactions? Um, and if so, why? Um, yeah. That's, uh, I mean, as a law enforcement officer, you're always carrying some type of weapon. Um, in my entire career as a law enforcement officer, um, I've drawn my gun a few times, a very small handful of times, but never discharged. Um, as I commented earlier in regards to the question about um, being hypervigilant and uh, always being aware of your surroundings, um, that's one of the key points. Um, you know, and the policy and procedures that we have in place for the use of firearms and deadly force. Um, again, and all that kind of force and also is all uh, documented uh, through our department uh, by policy. Uh, as for your question in regards to, do I feel that I should go armed to every single call? Uh, my answer is yes. Um, do I need said firearm on every single call? No, because it stays in the holster. Um, and like I said, uh, in my career as a law enforcement officer, I've drawn my weapon a very small handful of times uh, and never discharged. Um, that's what we have. The, the weapon is there for our safety and public safety. Um, it's not there as a show of force or anything like that, uh, but I know it is perceived as such. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, yeah, that does. Um, I, I'm just curious uh, when officers uh, even unholster um, the firearm is that documented as well i i'm i yes. was just unclear on that it is every time the weapon gets drawn it is a documented event okay great is that public record or is that kept in internal it, it is kept internal but uh we and again that's that fluid mix that we're kind of going through that uh in regards to their transparency is what we're working on someone could put in a public records request if they wanted to. Um, one question from earlier in the meeting was what efforts are being made to recruit more diverse applicants? Uh, again, I'm gonna be brutally honest with you. Uh, my applicant pool uh, thus far has been very minimal. Um, I think I've got uh, two applicants for deputy um, in the last couple of months. Um, and uh, I am in desperate need of dispatchers. Um, predominantly all my applicants are white. Um, 
but uh, I'm not really seeing the applications coming in as what I have in the past. So the answer is nothing? Pretty much. <laughs> uh, Tom. Oh, you're still muted. There we go. There we go. Um, th thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, uh, can you, everybody hear me now? Sure. Okay, great. Um, I, I think it's a significant concern, and this is actually probably a question best for Sheriff Bonyak, um, that there does not seem to be a concerted statewide effort among law enforcement to mandate diversity and racial bias training as a routine part of uh, preparing officers for going out in the field. And I'm wondering if the State Sheriff's Association has looked at this issue and whether there's consideration being given um, also among police chiefs and the state police to diversity and racial bias training being a formal part of the training that new officers go through. It actually is. It is. Yes. I sit on the committee. Okay. And, and um, so, so who, who uh, gives that training? Currently, it's Etan Nazred and Longo, who is co-chair of the Fair and Partial Policing Committee. He's a community member, and he works with Lieutenant Gary, or Captain Gary Scott. Okay. And it's also mandated every other year, Fair and Impartial Policing training. Okay. I, I will tell you it's not great. And it's not, I mean, we were just talking about it today. It needs so much more, and it should be its own, like, massive training. We're talking about how to make it bigger and better and infuse it through all parts of uh, policing. Uh, how does it, if I can just follow up on that, how does it get to the roots? Somebody raised the question earlier about whether officers are pursuing um, coming to terms with their own racial biases um, on an individual level. How, how, how does it address sort of the innate racial biases that white people are born into this world with, let's face it. Um, uh, I, I'm just curious how you get to that as part of the process of, of really getting individuals to look at, at themselves um, uh, and not just the broader question of fair and equitable policing, but you know, down in the gut, in the heart, you know, of really dealing with it on an individual level. Um, Caitlin, do you want to take over closed captioning? And Bill, do you want to answer this or do you want me yeah, to? Yeah, I can unmute Bill. And you, um, yeah, let me see if I can. Bill has his hand up. Do you want to answer it? Would you like me to? Let's both do it. How's that? Okay, do you want to start or you want me to start? You can start. Go ahead. Okay, so in the academy, they have a four hour block called Fair and Impartial um, Police and Training. I Aside from that, we're working on integrating more into, especially into the intro where they learn about the bias history and the racist history of policing. They watch the movie 13th um, and they talk about uh, the new Jim Crow and other resources like that. And then in the four hour block with um, Dr. Nasreddin Longo, um, who is an African-American uh, man, he talks to them about implicit bias and about personal experience with bias as well. So is it sufficient? No. And the Criminal Justice Training Council will tell you it is not sufficient. It's nowhere near sufficient, um, which is why we're constantly trying to revise it. That's why they're supposed to have ongoing training. But um, the hope is that the personal connection, uh, we just talked today about Dr. Nazra and Longo continuing to stay on at the academy for an additional couple of days um, to continue to develop relationships with the new recruits. This is the one tenth, I believe. Um, to help them to start to talk about racism in their own lives and to develop those sorts of connections that will help them to reflect more honestly with themselves about what's going on. Bill, do you wanna take it? Yeah. Oops, Oops. we're not, I'm not hearing Bill. Yeah, yeah, Bill, you're garbled. I'm not sure what's. Oh. Maybe he moved to an area in his house where there's poor reception. Not that I have personal experience. Was that Tom that was speaking? Tom, while we're waiting for Bill to catch up, was there anything that you wanted to say in response to that? Because like I said, we know it's not inadequate. I, no. I'm on there, the NAACP, 
Um, no, I just, I, I just gained the impression earlier from what Scott was saying that um, diversity and racial bias training was not a routine part of things. And so that was a misunderstanding on my, on my part, but um, no, I don't have any follow-up. Um, thank you for. That was Act 50, oh, I'm always terrible with Act numbers, 56, that passed, passed three years ago that mandated uh, fair and impartial policing training and uh, more comprehensive component in the Criminal Justice Training Council yeah. um, program. Um, but I think as Hannah and uh, Lucy pointed out, departments have to be doing so much more on their own. You have to, right. you can't not, because it is yeah. such an insidious part of what we do. A lot of the answers tonight were, you know, I, you know, half there, because you haven't had the opportunity to even understand what you don't know. You know, you don't know what you don't know. Right, right, right. Um, I, I think there's a real merit to that um, ongoing engagement on the part of the departments and the officers. Um, I mean, even even here in in Randolph, our library is conducting ongoing reading groups. I noticed that um, my, my friend and colleague and neighbor here in the community, Ramsey Papp, posted something earlier about a book group that she's involved in. I would just really encourage the sheriff's department and all of our first responders around the area to take it upon themselves as a department and as individuals to continue the work that gets done at the academy and, and make it a personal commitment. I think it's really important. I think it's really important for all of us. I mean, I'm an elected official here in, in Randolph and I see others um, from the select board and the state legislature on this call. And I think we all need to do the work. We all need to do the work. Can you hear me now, Sheriff Bill? There you are, Bill. So uh, just getting back with the academy, instead of four hours, it should be a minimum at the academy level, 16 hours. Um, and then it doesn't stop there. It's, it's back when you're back at the office, back with your department. You know, the, the cadet comes out of the academy, you know, I believe it's up to almost 20 weeks now. When they come back, you know, you're, they got to be on like an FTA, FTO program, field training. And uh, you keep an eye on them and see how they interact with people. And even their general talk, if you see biases, whether, you know, they just, their general interactions. So we need to pay attention to that. And if we see that, we need to correct it. And if we can't correct it, then the person needs to um, go down the road and find another line of work. Uh, we can't tolerate it. And uh, I know you're going to see a huge change at the academy level. The reason I bring that up is that, uh, and Tabitha and Caitlin probably know this already, that the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council has added um, the ACLU, migrant, uh, not migrant justice, but uh, the Human Rights Commission to the council members. And they may add, I believe, and there's a, a line, any other interested parties. So you're going to see a change at the academy. Um, and that's where I think you'll, the new officers will really get a, a better understanding of what is going on in our communities and what's going on, not just in, in our communities, but statewide, nationwide. And you're right. The biases are everywhere. Um, you know, the indirect bias, um, you know, we need to, to realize that and making sure we're getting and teaching our officers, you know, the training and education they need to deal with these issues. Uh, it's here, it's, it's now, we must face it. We are at 7.30, which is uh, how long this meeting was planned to last. I wanna be respectful of people's time, but I know we did not get to everyone's questions. Um, 
It sounds like the sheriff's department is open to a second forum or further forums, and it sounds like people are interested in that. Caitlin, I, w I just want to add one, one yeah. more thing. Uh, in the near future, we'll be doing some in-house training on different aspects of uh, law enforcement. And what we want to do is, you know, advertise this to the public and invite the public in uh, to get a, a flavor of what we, what we do for training and how we do training. So um, stay tuned, that, that's going to happen. Thank you. Mickey, I see you waving. Yeah. Just, just a reminder. What? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I just want to say what I said a few minutes ago, that I'm going to contact each one of you and to try and get feedback of things that weren't answered for you tonight and ways that we could go forward. Because I... Um, I think a lot, a lot of things need to be continued to be said and worked on. And I'd like to do another meeting down the road after we get some feedback. I can't moderate and type at the same time. Can <laughs> we take over one or the other? Uh, either you want to, I'll keep typing if you want to wrap up. Okay. So um, a quick wrap up issue, I guess I don't really have a whole lot to say other than thank you, Caitlin, for moderating, um, Neil and Mickey for putting this together. I really do hope that the Randolph community um, continues to um, ask your law enforcement officials difficult questions. Law enforcement officials, I hope you continue to grow based on what they tell you. Um, the only way we're gonna get through it, right? Um, thank you all for asking all of the questions. I apologize to anyone who's relying on my terrible closed captioning skills. My hands are so sore right now. <laughs> um, Neil, close us out. I do want to thank everyone for coming out. Oh, Neil, you, you do have one person that had one quick statement, a 10 second statement that needed to be made before you thank everybody. That would be Becca. Hey, Becca, I'm muting you. Go ahead. Oh, you're still, oh, I unmuted you, but we can't hear you. It's kind of the worst. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I uh, really appreciate you guys getting this together. And I want to say thank you, especially to our law enforcement officers. I know they're making a lot of changes and um, that they might not know what that looks like now. And um, but I appreciate all they have done and all they continue to do for us. And that's all I want to say. Thank you, Becca. And thanks to the community for showing up and caring enough to uh, well, keep going on this dialogue. Um, actually, I wanted to, I just want to take one second. I can't see everyone's face, um, but I, if there are any people who are people of color who want a moment to to speak, I want to just like hold space for that specifically since um, there has not been a lot of input from that community. If folks want to raise their hands or, or send me a message, just give it a moment. Okay. Not a lot of us showed up. This is yeah. a hard space to be in. Yep. I understand that. So. Are we all? Thank you, Caitlin, for doing this for me. And thank you, Tabitha, for coming out. Okay. Always, Neil. Are we, are we done? <laughs> all right. So, yeah. So, we'll send a follow up email to everybody. Um, and look for another one in the future.